Hello and welcome to the SC20 plenary panel. My name is David Abramson from the University of Queensland Research Computing Centre. If you're like me, you're probably sick and tired of hearing something about COVID at every turn. Every news bulletin, every documentary and public interest show seems to be transfixed on what's happening. But our field of advanced computing is playing a vital role in the search for understanding of this plague and for effective cures. So we wanted to take a deep dive and have a look at what our researchers are doing. Together with colleague Tony Pena from the Barcelona Supercomputing Centre, we've assembled a team of experts to discuss the role of advanced computing in COVID-19 research. They come from four diverse fields, but together they paint a picture showing the enormous potential of our work. It's so much more than HPC. Romy Amaro is a professor and endowed chair of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. Her research focuses on development of computational methods in biophysics for application to drug discovery. Most recently, she is leading efforts to build the first complete all-atom model of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus envelope, its exterior component. Romy, tell us a bit more about your work. My name is Romy Amaro. I'm from UC San Diego, and I'm going to tell you today about our work to simulate with all-atom detail all of the atomic movements of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So. The deal is that there are really incredible advances in the acquisition of biological structural data. But um, no matter how state of the art these approaches are, there are aspects of the virus structure and dynamics and function that evade our ability to actually see. And so what we're doing in my group is to build um, all atom models of the different components of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what you're looking at right here is the so-called spike protein. And then to simulate this structure using all atom molecular dynamic simulations. These simulations run on some of the largest HPC infrastructure that we have available to us. And they tell researchers, again, information that can't be experimentally seen. One thing that we're really interested in is understanding all those little wiggling and jiggling balls that look like Christmas ornaments hanging off that spike protein. These are something called glycans. Glycans basically form a sugary shield to mask the protein from the human immune system. And although researchers have the ability to understand what their molecular composition is, what we can't do using experiment is to actually see what it looks like. And so this is one of the things that we're exploring with uh, HPC. So on the left, you can see an example of uh, the sort of the naked spike protein. This is without really considering glycans. And on the right, you see what a different picture we get when we actually consider the glycans. And those that sugary shield is shown in the dark blue sort of tufts or puffs that you see sort of decorating the whole surface of it. And why we care about this is because if you are trying to design vaccine candidates or, for example, new therapeutics, researchers need to be able to know where on the spike is actually accessible for these molecules. And so these types of simulations that we do, uh, which are quite computationally intensive, actually can, uh, can give us this additional insight into the system. And one of the um, things that this movie will show is basically that not only one of the things that we discovered, which was quite surprising, was that not only do these shields act like do these sugars act like a shield to mask the protein from the human immune system, but in the case of these two brightly colored um, sort of structures underneath, they actually help to lock and load the spike protein for infection, basically by helping to sort of maintain the structure, its, its structure and function. And then I also just want to say that the, the whole simulation community, you know, it's much more than the work just being done in my group. There's a whole community of researchers who are really actively investigating uh, the sort of molecular piece parts of the virus and have been using a diversity of HPC architectures, not only in the U.S., but all over the world. And we've committed to sharing not only our methods 
uh, but also our data and models so that we can all sort of collectively move forward as quickly as possible. And so we've been able to generate, you know, my group in particular has been able to generate some very, very large data sets of these sort of very highly detailed systems. And they've already been shared, you know, over 4,000 times with people all over the world. So um, this has really been a great community effort where HPC has played a central role in helping us to understand these new facets of the virus. Thanks, Romy. Alex Espigiani is a joint appointment between the College of Science, the College of Computer Information Science at the Bouvet College of Health Sciences at Northeastern University in Boston. His research is, is focused on the study of technosocial systems, where infrastructure composed of different technological layers are interoperated with the social component that drives their use and development. Recently, he published a finding that if rich countries monopolize COVID vaccines, it could cause twice as many deaths as distributing them equally. Alex, tell us a bit more about your work. So thank you very much, David. Yeah, if we uh, want to uh, do a kind of metaphor, you know, what, what we are doing in terms of, uh, of modeling and computation is the what is done uh, by uh, numerical weather forecast, but in the area of infectious diseases. Uh, well, let me say that models uh, and, 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 and computing uh, actually uh, are more than forecasting for infectious diseases. They also do uh, situational awareness, uh, intervention planning scenarios, uh, um, you know, also distribution of vaccination scenarios. So they are used in a way that is uh, much more than just uh, projecting or forecasting what is, uh, what is the number of cases uh, uh, of a certain disease in the next day. Uh, what we do with the model is, is to, to, to basically recreate synthetic world in the computer in which we have uh, detailed data in real time about the, the transportation, both international and domestic uh, through airlines. We have commuting patterns. We we have other uh, mobility uh, patterns that we, we, we get for, for the entire countries and the world and very high detail population maps with attributes. And then we go, you know, and we can ask questions about the infectious disease spreading, the where, uh, when and how much, a different geographical resolution that goes from a single country or the worldwide uh, or worldwide till, uh, till uh, specific urban areas. And the way we integrate data about single individuals too uh, answers different questions. You can go down to level of what we call the very super high detail agent-based model in which we recreate uh, the population down to the level of the single household. We can see what is the, the issue of, of, of supercomputing here. You know, given a model, we, we have obviously specific modeling assumptions that, that might depend on the way we, we, uh, we analyze the, 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 the transmissibility or the way that the, the disease is, is uh, spread from individuals to individuals. But then, especially at the beginning of, of, uh, of an emerging pathogen, we have a lack of uh, knowledge of the initial condition. So where, how many cases, they, they, there is always uh, uh, incomplete information. And then all the parameter uncertainty. So what is the incubation time of a new virus? What is the uh, what is the, 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 the reproductive number and so on and so forth. Uh, then there is all the stochasticity inherent to the, to the process. So if we are in a room with somebody who is infectious, uh, uh, well, there is not uh, a 100% probability of, of becoming infected. And so, you know, there are stochasticity that is added to the dynamic of every model. And so what we have to do is to consider all that possible trajectories that are generated through the, uh, uh, how to say, the, the partial knowledge of parameters and initial conditions and the stochasticity uh, that is natural to the model. And those means uh, that uh, those trajectory have to, to be simulated millions of time. And they, uh, when they are aggregated together, generate the cone of uncertainty that uh, when we, uh, how to say, aggregate all the, 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 those trajectory, generate what we call a probabilistic, a probabilistic forecast. And here, you know, is where we end up in having uh, the, the supercomputing problem because all this is uh, extremely intensive and we can see that just a, a round of calibration can imply millions of runs uh, on millions of instances of, of machines and, you know, produce uh, uh, 
terabyte and terabyte of data. So it's not just a matter of uh, high performance computing, but also of high performance uh, uh, data, data analysis. Um, this is, uh, 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 it's again, I want to stress that is uh, uh, again a very collaborative effort. So there are many, many uh, teams around the world producing different models and different uh, uh, projections and scenario and forecast. And, and, and the work is indeed to generate ensemble of, of, of those uh, analyses so that we can, can have more uh, reliability by looking at different approaches and providing, uh, providing similar results. So this is what is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, done by the Center for Disease Control through the uh, COVID-19 initiative that, that project the, the, the progression of the disease uh, on a time horizon of, of four weeks. And that is, uh, has to be repeated for each country and also for different questions like uh, what is the effect of vaccination, what is the effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions like uh, uh, lockdowns or, or just uh, the school closure. So this is uh, 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 where we have the stress of the, 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 the supercomputing needs, the, the high performance computing. And, and I think uh, the COVID-19 case has been an exemplary situation for the application of those uh, technologies. Thanks, Alex. Ilke Altentas is a data and computer scientist and researcher in the domain of high performance computing applications. Ilke serves as the Chief Data Science Officer of the San Diego Supercomputing Center at the University of California, San Diego. Her research objective is the development of methods, cyber infrastructure and workflows for computational data science and its translation to practical outcomes. Her Wi-Fi lab aimed to be an all hazards knowledge cyber infrastructure, becoming a management layer for the data collection to modeling efforts, including COVID-19. She's achieved significant success in helping manage wildfires. Okay, tell us a bit more about how your work is playing out in COVID-19. I'm gonna talk about hazards as a general area of application of big data and IoT uh, to motivate our panel today. And I'd like to uh, make a statement that when the problem is hazards, it's not just collecting data or having the technology for the data to be there, but our ability to turn that data into value that saves us lives. And this is very important to keep in mind when we are approaching data challenges. So what I mean with this turning value is we use knowledge management and computing and many other technologies as an ecosystem to get the data and our ability to monitor can be value, our ability to analyze and visualize and create predictive models and simulations in a data-driven way uh, using data could be a value. And all of this again become value and insights for it. But more importantly, recognizing the application of what we are doing with data. And really um, thinking of this as hazards have different stages from preparedness to recovery, to mitigation, to response. And it's not uh, one or the other. So when we have the data together and our ability to turn that into value, we can uh, think of uh, using it for preparedness prior to a hazard. We can use it for response or mitigation. And after uh, the hazard passes, we can use it for to recover from or learn from uh, what just happened and use it for preparedness and mitigation or the next uh, generation response scenarios. So it's obvious then what we need here is a data system that can integrate catalog curate, exchange, analyze, optimize, that drives collaboration through data using big data and modeling at scale. And we need to do it in an intelligent way that actually brings context and helps us with interpretability of the data. But more importantly, turning such data uh, using team science with many expertise is a very interdisciplinary thing. Uh, and you know, using convergence and translation approaches so we can actually use the data in scientific and technological practices that can be translated into practical applications uh, is 
the other part of the picture. So we need to find the balance between data and computing ecosystem and how we are actually integrating things and how we are solving problems. And in the fire space, I was asked to talk a little bit about our fire application. We've done this for uh, wildfire data integration and monitoring. So the same data sets we, can, we are using for monitoring and visualizing them to get insights that are lower dimensional insights than just the bits, monitoring the bits themselves. And we are also generating uh, insights using dynamic data-driven fire modeling and AI and computing together. Uh, how data comes together, for instance, when we talk about fire behavior modeling during in response or for uh, preparedness type, type of scenario generation, uh, we can use better forecasts or long-term weather models, uh, real-time sensors, fire perimeters and other satellite flight drone detections, landscape data, uh, pre uh, previous fire uh, data, you know, the incidents that happened uh, in the past, and combine that understanding from the data with the physical understanding of fire uh, and the simulations related to it. And once we get that, being able to communicate that through maps to decision makers is a part of uh, that activity. And when we think about it, there is data and computing here. We can see data, I think, a lot more clearly than computing and AI. Uh, computing is not just in the simulation, but there are many things that can be done through AI. Uh, when we think of data coming from many different sources for biomass or land cover, which we call fuels for fire, uh, weather, both predictive and observed weather, and imagery that's collected uh, as just some sets of these data. Uh, our ability to learn from the data through AI helps us to parameterize simulations and ensembles that give us the fire behavior model a lot more effectively. Um, so we see a lot of use of data management, AI, and edge, cloud, uh, and other types of computing here. I think COVID-19 is very similar to this. Uh, we heard many good examples of science uh, and in different parts of the solution. And when we look at the COVID-19 problems, um, data comes from in the form of disease data, virus models, variables, public health surveys and social media, the contact data, or you name it. There are many different data sets that, uh, that were collected on uh, the disease itself, along with the virus and the societal, uh, uh, societal events around it. Um, when we look at the models, they are on spread modeling, um, drug design, uh, societal impact, health, mental health impact, uh, epidemiological models. All of these are being done to help manage and understand the disease. And it could be practical in the context of decision support, policy making, vaccine development, treatment, the cure. Now, there are so many things we could do in this preparedness, mitigation, response, recovery phases that we are learning from the event that we are all going through uh, as a society. Uh, one example of it is our 10 Predict project. This is a project very special because it, I think, individualizes the disease. Uh, a lot of the models and data we are seeing is at the societal public health level. Uh, Tem Predict uh, is a collaboration between Aurora and UCSF Health and UCSD. Uh, is to create an early alerting system based on the variables and public health surveys uh, that are being conducted with the same individuals. And to date, uh, 50,000 uh, and counting individuals signed up to donate their data. Uh, and this ring is uh, a monitor of heart rate, fever, uh, uh, sleep, and many other indicators, body indicators. And 500, and now actually there's a little more, of these individuals are known to have COVID-19 during the time they collected data. So that this gives us actually uh, a very important data set to look at the early onset of the disease, what happens to the body in, at the individual level during the disease and after the disease. And when you look at some of these graphs, some of the data set has individuals with flu during uh, this process. And uh, 
you know, we can compare flu versus uh, COVID-19 effects on the body. And there are many other questions that can be answered uh, about the disease using this data set and its treatment. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thanks, Ilke. Rick Stevens is Argonne's Associate Laboratory Director for Computing, Environment and Life Sciences. Rick is interested in the development of innovative tools and techniques that enable computational scientists to solve important large-scale problems effectively on advanced scientific computers. Rick has been applying machine learning techniques to a wide range of problems, including the search of covered drug targets. Tell us a bit more about your work, Rick. Thanks, David. Let me uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing in uh, drug discovery for COVID. Um, Back in March, uh, we assembled a team uh, initially from Argonne and the University of Chicago, and then it quickly grew to over 200 people over the internet uh, from many of our colleagues, including people in San Diego and Texas and, and other labs and universities. And then in April, uh, DOE stood up a nine lab collaboration uh, to work on uh, using a molecular design to drive uh, medical therapeutics for COVID. And what we try to do, and we're still doing this, is to compress the upfront uh, phases of drug development into a very short period of time. Normally, as you can see on this slide, uh, the drug discovery process and the drug development process has four big phases, an R&D process, a preclinical studies process, clinical trials, and review and approvals. And um, people often hear about clinical trials. This is after you've got a candidate uh, therapy and you're doing safety trials and then efficacy trials. Uh, but up front of that is somewhere between four and six, seven years worth of work to go from identifying the drug targets to screening uh, computationally and experimentally large numbers of compounds, identifying those compounds that are leads, uh, refining them, testing them for toxicity, various kinds of uh, preclinical studies. Uh, to eventually work towards uh, having something ready to go in a clinical trial. And what we've been trying to do is to accelerate this first part. And uh, in the red box here is, is what the team's been working on and where we've got the four red check marks uh, shows you kind of where we are. And I'll walk you through this uh, process. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, advances in machine learning and drug development in general. So over the last uh, decade or so, there's been great progress in uh, devising methods for applying machine learning to improve uh, the processes in drug discovery. So I mentioned these four stages. And um, uh, we've been mostly working on the first two uh, stages and um, highlighted here in red are some of the things that our group has done and, and other groups, of course, are working on. And we've been doing most of this work in the context of cancer and in antibiotic development. Um, but uh, in the context of COVID, we pivoted some of these methods uh, and have, have focused on uh, COVID. So um, the environment that we've built uh, is really aimed at trying to accelerate this, this uh, the steps that go from when we have a drug target in mind, we have a structure of that drug target, a, a molecular structure, and uh, we're going to do physics-based uh, docking of the small molecules, the compounds, uh, against the protein targets. Um, and uh, as we find uh, uh, compounds that uh, are predicted to bind, to refine that understanding through molecular dynamics, and then ultimately to refine that understanding through more advanced computations to estimate uh, more accurately, say, binding. And each one of these stages, there's opportunity to improve the physics-based models by applying machine learning methods. And I'll focus on this first stage here where we spent most of our time so far. This is taking um, uh, traditional virtual screening methods through tools like Autodoc and OpenEyeFred and Doxix and, and other tools, um, and we use the physics-based docking to screen some large number of compounds, typically uh, hundreds of thousands to a million or so compounds. And we take that data and we use that to train machine learning models to then scan a much larger database. So the space of possible molecules that uh, could be drugs are something like 10 to the 60th, but we obviously can't uh, compute on something that large. Um, but as part of this COVID effort, we've assembled an open source database of 4.2 
billion molecules from 26 different public databases. And what we wanted was a method to actually search that entire collection for each drug target and for each drug receptor in each drug target. And just using high performance computing physics based methods that would not be possible in, in the amount of compute time that we have on, even on the biggest machines. But by using machine learning trained on initial docking results, we can get an uh, inference rate that's about 50,000 times faster than using the physics models. That allows us to then take each one of these drug targets, uh, train them on a sample set, build predictors, do inference across the very large set, scoop up the high scoring hits, redock them on the physics-based models, then inject them into this pipeline. So that's what we've been doing over the last uh, few months. At some very high level, we can think of this uh, processing uh, loop that I'm talking, or the processing pipeline, as having uh, four stages. So this first stage where we identify drug targets, um, the virus codes for about 28 proteins. Uh, some of these make pretty good targets, depending on where in the virus life cycle you want to inhibit it. Uh, whether it's virus entry, whether it's uh, viral replication and DNA processing, or whether it's uh, host inter interacting with host processes or in exit from the cell. Uh, we've selected about uh, 10 uh, of these uh, target molecules as our primary targets. Um, and we, as I mentioned earlier, did this uh, AI-driven virtual screening. Um, we boiled that down to about 1,000 uh, predicted uh, candidates. We then uh, ordered all of these molecules. Um, and ran experimental assays on them, uh, both functional assays and whole cell assays. And from that result, we have now around 40 uh, uh, high quality hits that are undergoing uh, further experimental analysis. The next stage that we're in right now is called structure activity relationships, where we make small perturbations in the molecules and then reassay them to understand, um, uh, to better improve our understanding of how they bind and, and how they inhibit the function. So this has been an amazing success. It's included uh, a very large uh, uh, set of players uh, from across uh, many universities, national labs, the supercomputer centers, our colleagues at the University of Chicago uh, running the Ricketts Lab. And uh, it's been a, a, both a lot of fun and also uh, very rewarding to see all of this uh, technology integrated into complex workflows that combine the physics with the AI methods. And with that, I'll turn it back to David. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. They were really great introductions to your work. So let's now open up the panel and have a bit more of an in-depth discussion. Now, what is it, Rami, that's holding you back? Um, you know, is it is it raw compute performance? I think was one of the paraphrases. Is it, you know, I could throw in a you know, is it lack of experimental data? You know. I mean, it's true. There's, there's, there are really a ton of challenges, right, from the experimental data, which is super important for us. Um, you know, we need sort of good structural starting data points to, you know, begin our sort of time dependent all the integration. Um, but that's coming. That's coming. So, you know, from more from a compute perspective, I think, you know, as we uh, move towards bigger and more complicated systems. We um, are definitely hit with an issue regarding, uh, you know, sort of analysis of these huge data sets. That's like, that's very cumbersome. I mean, ways to, better ways to do that sort of remotely so researchers don't have to pull down these huge data sets and try to interact with them in real time um, would be good or optimize ways to do that interaction. Uh, it's certainly one part. Workflows is another big uh, component where, you know, we want to sort of have better integrated uh, analysis methods perhaps that also integrate, for example, artificial intelligence and so forth, and being able to detect particular events sort of automatically uh, and then sort of continue the run without stopping so often and doing sort of like our sort of manual assessment. Um, those are some, I think, some some sort of big challenges that we are all, that we're facing in, in sort of the space of molecular simulation. And now you can bring the question, Alex, and, and just turn that one around to you. So, you know, given the scale of the models you're trying to work with, what is it that's holding you back? Yeah, I think here I can, uh, I can add a sobering perspective. Uh, uh, it's really the real world data that is holding us back. Uh, perhaps a very few, you know, we are developing these wonderful technologies, these wonderful pipelines, uh, programs, uh, supercomputing. Uh, you know what is at the moment? the median delay from uh, the 
actual death of a person to the reporting of the data. At this point, uh, we are in October, is three weeks, the median time. So you see that you are trying to do forecasts, you are trying to do projections uh, that are for the next few weeks, uh, but you are working with data which are extremely uh, delayed. And the granularity of the data is a problem. So there are many, many things that uh, where the technology, so we should improve at that, at that level. We should bring the same speed, the same power that we have then in the supercomputing, in, in, the, in the data, so, in the HPA data analysis to the data collection. And that's however is a, is a, is a big step. Rick, let me turn that question back to you a little bit because you're working a lot uh, perhaps more on the technology side of what's coming up. I know you guys have recently acquired things like the Cerberus, um, you know, ML mm -hmm. frameworks and there's FPGA platforms and the like coming along. What what do you see coming up on the on the infrastructure horizon that you think might you know accelerate? Uh, well, I think there's ser several things going on. I mean, there's a lot of uh, these startups trying to make AI accelerators like Cerberus and Salmonova and GraphCore and Grok and others. And those are starting to work. Uh, they're deployed. Uh, you know, Argon has some of these systems. I know other labs have some of these systems. And, uh, you know, we're moving our models to them. That's giving us acceleration in training. It's giving us uh, some ability to do experiments that, uh, you know, are different from what we can do with GPUs. But we've got lots of GPUs, too. So it's, it's really not uh, fundamentally changing, you know, what, what can be done. But um, it is giving us a way to think about the future. Um, you know, and what we're doing with the COVID drug uh, design work, um, you know, the rate limiter step right now isn't uh, our ability to train the machine learning models. Um, it's really the uh, experimental process at the other end. Uh, so we, we, we're able to make a lot of predictions uh, much faster than we can assay them, and certainly much faster we can get then we can get compounds if we have to order them or if we're trying to synthesize them. So I, I think what's needed, you know, as we look forward is some, uh, as we advance on the AI and, and simulation side, we've got to realize that on data acquisition, automated experiments, uh, automated chemical synthesis, uh, you know, things like that, that has to happen. We, we have to push into the experimental space to build a balanced ecosystem where the simulation and AI and experiments are going to come along at, at the, kind of the same rate. So that's that's going to be a big enterprise, I think, for the next 10, 20 years, is to really push on automation in the broader space of science than just uh, you know what we do in our simulation or AI parts. Well, there's also um, there's also going to be you know an equal sort of challenge to what Rick sort of your dream of really automating the whole pipeline is also going to be a huge sort of cultural change for the folks in chemistry who are synthesizing the molecules and yeah. the folks in biology who are running the experiments. I mean, there's right now a pretty big gap between the dream that you just articulated and really sort of where 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 they're at, you know. And I but I fully agree with you. Yes, once we uh, yeah, get there, sure. that's going the, to really be a game changer. Yeah, it's the business, of course, of SC to dream these things and realize that, you know, the scope of what is in bounds for advancing science and advancing scientific computing, I think, is about to explode, right? I mean, robotics, automated labs, yeah. uh, the kinds of applications where we're not just going to compute uh, you know, a property that we might observe in the lab, but we're actually going to compute a whole trajectory of experiments and we're going to estimate. Uh, we're going to use uh, causal inference, and then we're going to have to say we have to do these 500 experiments or 1,000 experiments, and then feed that data back. And we want to do that as fast as we can compute, um, and that's going to require, as you say, uh, Romy, a complete sea change in how our chemists and biology colleagues and material science colleagues are, you know, ready to play, right? And and mm -hmm. in the context mm -hmm. of these environmental applications. Uh, or in the case of epidemiology, right, we should be thinking in terms of what's the sensor outlays that we could make that would solve these problems, right? I mean, Alex talks about delays in reporting data. Well, why the hell? I mean, you know, why aren't we just having mechanisms that can collect this data automatically? I mean, why, why do people have to be in that loop, right? I mean, that's what we're seeing in personalized uh, medicine. I mean, personalized, uh, you know, quantitative mm -hmm. self type stuff, right? Where we're replacing uh, an official 
person making an observation with devices that can make observations. And I think that that's also got to be part of the story going forward. So, okay, maybe you could um, comment on that because yeah. you've been doing that on an environmental space. Yeah, both environmental and personalized medicine space with our temperature study as well. I think it's important to recognize that there are many ways we can collect data today. The social media data, there's variables, there are things that could be installed in um, built infrastructure for uh, following the virus, like going into sewage actually to detect uh, existence mm -hmm. of COVID-19 is happening uh, for early alerts. Um, so there are so many things that can be done by collecting data in a responsible fashion so that we can, at the same time, inform other systems. So I think the solution to data collection will come from integrating different streams of data into uh, a knowledge environment that uh, many types of questions can be informed with. And AI is a big part of it, turning that multidimensional data into the dimensions that different problems can understand as insights and using AI techniques to uh, turn those data sets also into predictions that we can combine with uh, sort of this dynamic data-driven simulations uh, of different sorts, for both for following the strains of the disease itself, but also for understanding human activity and uh, the effects of it uh, from human health to human, you know, not just fi um, uh, physical health, but to mental health and other types of societal efforts. So I think we'll see this data collected at all scales from the individual, or even like from the atom to the, you know, yeah. person to the societal level. So uh, we'll see. I think at different scales, effects of data and computing. Well, one of the things that sort of does keep me up at night is how we, um, how do I articulate this? How we help, like how do we really help to make this, these sort of cultural sort of swings, you know? Is it with these sort of leading edge examples of teams sort of pushing these individual sort of experiments in some automated way. Is there like, is there another way that we really sort of help to, to sort of, to catalyze that social construct change? Or maybe, you I know, maybe that's a, a question too difficult. I don't know. I think it's a question comp that's not too difficult, but too complex, because I think a part of it is legal. And there are a lot okay. of challenges in responsible use of data when you think of personalization of solutions. Sure, yeah, yeah. And especially if we talk about closed loop between effectivity of drug treatments and individuals and their experience through the disease or, uh, you know, the societal changes around it, I think we are going into much harder questions, so to say, of uh, how do we bring the system that collects and utilizes this data together with the computing and AI uh, things that can be done. So I think demonstrating, mm -hmm. it's, it's a cultural change, like anything data science, and demonstrating what can be done at least to raise, raise eyebrows at this time yeah. is important. Well, and maybe the place to start, though, isn't in the healthcare space directly or in the, directly with patient, right? We know with the Internet of Things that in the built environment, you know, we can sensorize, we can do things, and we can automate the processes um, without this kind of friction that comes from the privacy and, and so on. And, and, of course, in the U.S., we have a certain system for this that has uh, maybe is not optimal for advancing yeah. progress. And other parts of the world have different trade-offs they're making in terms of um, healthcare, um, and so we may not be the ideal place to pioneer some of these things. I thought, though, when, Ram when Rami was talking that she was actually kind of thinking more in terms of not so much the patient thing, but more in terms of the scientific just research people. space. Yeah, just, yeah. And, and just yeah. Uh, because, you know, what we, what we think is, is uh, the case is that, you know, groups that um, demonstrate uh, success, and, and of course it takes a lot of uh, work up front before you get to that success, but if you start showing that you can do something dramatically more powerful than what your colleagues can do, eventually people will flip to doing that because they it's a competitiveness thing, right? 
And so uh, what, it, what we're going to take, though, is enough pilots and enough uh, examples to where it's not just some person being, you know, some group, I'm often accused of this, but, you know, being crazy trying to do something over here, but, but it starts to oh, become, yeah. gee, there's half a dozen <laughs> groups doing this, and it's starting to become a little bit uh, normal. And at that point, um, you know, it, it starts to take a lot on a life of its own. And the issue is how to get institutionally, how do we get to things to, to that state? Well, I in agree. Some cases, and what we what we are asking to those fields which are the input and output the input and output of what we do is to reinvent themselves. It's not just a matter of uh, of how to say, for instance, in terms of uh, you know the novel digital data streams. It's not just a matter of uh, of of legal uh, or or uh, ethical boundaries, but it's also the fact that uh, really you have to reinvent the methodology in which you collect public health data. You are uh, analyzing public health data from um, that are not, um, how to say, not made for that kind of analysis. So you have to convince a field that, that those are valuable data, that you can use those proxy data to provide mm -hmm. valuable information, that uh, the time of turnaround of of, of, of that we can provide with, with computing is, uh, is is on a complete different time scale than uh, those fields are used uh, are used to. Same. And in a sense, you yeah. know, that our our way of, of working with data becomes driving for the other fields. That is also something difficult to accept. You know, when you when you say, well, now they have to change the pipeline of how you you try uh, to do to do you do experiments for for testing new drugs. Uh, you know, basically, you are dictating <laughs> how how to do that, and 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 you know, this is a huge uh, change that is not cultural; is is really reinventing the field in a in, in a way, mm -hmm. and that's that's a lot. I wanted to pick up on, on a slightly different question here around. So, so, so one of the critical things for for everybody here is that we trust the outputs of our models, and of course, you know, there's no. There's no greater example of that in climate science where this stuff has all been challenged. Now, I guess, you know, for Romy, the test for some of the theoretical chemistry is going to be, you know, to experimentalist guys, go and make oh, yeah. this thing for me and let's measure that, right? So it's very controlled. Um, but, but, you know, Alex, the problem you've got is this is a living lab, right? It's unfolding in front of us. Um, so, so have you got some methods or are you changing the way you do things there that, we not only get results, but you know, we get we get results that that people are actually going to believe. Are there some techniques that we can? Well, you know, that is uh, is one of the big challenge. So the validation of of the model that you that you uh, uh, implement the the the. Uh, I think, however, for instance, from weather forecasts, we got way also to go around that. You know, it's uh, I I don't think that we want to go into a super model that has all the answers and is the the, the one that is reliable. What we are going uh, to is to use super ensemble and ensemble and super ensemble techniques in which you combine a portfolio of models, then you ensemble the results, uh, and then you have a kind of uh, uh, more reliable trajectory for what is the epidemic or what is the, the, the public health uh, uh, threat or, or, or problem you're analyzing. And this, however, brings even more the, 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 the supercomputing uh, and the high-performance computing dimension because it's not just a matter of uh, having one model, but actually to have portfolio of models and then combine them, that just, you know, all the data analysis of the output of those models, their combination becomes a, a, a high-performance uh, computing challenge. And that's uh, that's what we are trying to do. For instance, for with the Center for Disease Control, at the moment, there is a COVID forecast hub that integrates more than uh, a dozen models so at this point. And this is this is the future. Each model has different assumptions, has different, has slightly different methodology. Some of them are uh, purely mechanistic, so they just do the simulations of at the single individual levels. Others are, you know, black box, more machine learning or deep learning algorithms. So, and you can combine those. And 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 uh, and the idea is really to 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 get the best of all of of those. Uh, uh, Worlds and I think, however, this uh, stress the importance of creating uh, 
national center, for instance, for uh, outbreak response, uh, to have infrastructure like the one that we created for, for weather forecasts and other problems, which tuber computing is at the center of those infrastructures. Yeah, that's I awesome. Oh, do you want to say, okay. Yeah. I wanted to add that, that there are things you could do through simulation and modeling. And I think this opens also the way our ability to collect data opens a way to do it in a dynamic way. So you don't have to model every parameter if some of them are measurable. And being able to take advantage of computing and AI to bring what's measurable and combine it with simulation uh, requires a, an ecosystem that's more heterogeneous than any of these different parts of the solutions are used to using or utilizing. So we need to take, be able to take advantage of edge and uh, exascale at the same time or big data systems and different networks. So all of it create an ecosystem and I think uh, a, a part of the solution will come from our ability to use these heterogeneous systems with uh, an even more effective middleware technology. So in the middle of that ecosystem, there are some missing bits for computing that needs to be solved uh, for us to be able to combine. Because like when I think of our fire uh, experience, when we started, just the fact that we claimed if we got ongoing perimeters from edge or other uh, types of sensing environments, uh, the ongoing measurements from the fire itself and combine it with ensembles of fire simulations, you know, we would be at a better uh, place to sort of incorporate the changes based on the individual fire behavior while it's happening. And just 10 years ago, when I said this, I really had people laughing at me. Right? You'll never get that type of data ever. And the goal there was to demonstrate. And 10 years later, indeed, it's, it's possible to collect that data and the techniques are getting ready. But together with those techniques, fire science is becoming, I think, more collaborative, transparent and open. I think groups are coming together to create those ensembles. And we are seeing more and more approaches of science and AI groups coming together to combine data and computing and turn that into practical insights. So I think in the public health or, you know, uh, sort of disease prediction and solution space, we'll see the same thing. It's going to be a lot more effective and easier if we put in the right data and computing systems to work together to solve the challenge. And that's one of the things that right now is standing in front of us as a blocker. There's a very good example, I think, of data sets sort of on the same theme of, you know, having sort of uh, a diverse group of models that all have sort of varying, you know, parameters and run uh, options and so forth now being generated actually in the molecular simulation community for COVID-19, where we've, you know, there's been an effort to collect all of the models and the data that have been run with this COVID-19 HPC consortium. And, you know, this was a really big step for our community to actually openly share that type of data. And now we really, I think, are in the process of building really sort of a vast coverage of the space of, for example, all of the molecular movements of those different piece parts of the, of the virus and the host proteins with which, you know, it interacts. Uh, it would be fantastic. I mean, I don't know of anybody who's actually thinking about, you know, how to take the thousand foot view of that data to, you know, learn. But certainly that's going to be there as a legacy from these types of projects uh, for COVID-19. Once, of course, it becomes common to get access to these large meta collections of things, um, it'll drive progress in AI, right? To, uh, because these things are not, you're not going to understand them by just staring at hundreds of hours of, you know, MDE simulation movies or whatever, you're going to, we're going to have sure. to build systems that can um, kind of in some sense ingest all of this data and, and be able to become kind of like a question answering system about the, the instances of data that it has. And um, in that sense, you know, we, we can imagine that, that the future is going to be not only about how do we set these problems up? How do we do the runs? How do we, you know, get a handful of, 
you know, oh, yeah. skim off the cream publications. But now you've got these large archives that can be mined in the future. And, and how do we design these things such that they can be? Um, you know, if you look at what's driven AI progress, it's certainly in the last kind of 10 years, where these, these kind of mammoth efforts like ImageNet to build training data that was labeled and that lots of people helped with. And of course, at the time, they were viewed as crazy to start those efforts mm -hmm. as well. And then, oh, yeah. of course, five years later, they're <laughs> winning competitions with it, the classic uh, paradigm shift. But um, the same thing is going to happen in these scientific simulation data sets. Um, and the big difference is that, you know, you can get a lot of people playing with computer vision because it, everybody has eyes almost and, and, and people, you know, can kind of uh, self-interpret what the data means. But now when we have these big data sets, like these big all-atom simulations of big systems, it, you kind of need an expert to interpret what's going on. And, the, and this is what I, I view, we're going to have this crisis of domain expertise, right? We're going to have lots and lots of data sets and we'll have CS people um, and architectures that can do AI, but we're going to have this rate limiting step, which is going to be um, how do we uh, character, you know, how do we understand whether the things we build to understand the data are actually understanding anything? And that's going to create a whole new discipline. Um, yeah. You know, how, how many experts can we cram into a box uh, and have them help? Uh, because we're going to need AI across all these spaces in science and engineering and medicine. Yeah. And there's not enough people yeah. really to do it. I mean, this is this is an argument for how AI is going to create jobs. It's also an argument for what's going to fuel the future of computing. Um, and it's going to be very different. It's, it's kind of like, you know, yeah. Wait, so, so in this view that you're talking about, um, do the domain people, what is new that they need to learn then? Is it the similar things or is it just, uh, are they going to have to have come to be with part skills? Of a, of a larger scale, a you know, teams to, um, to help and work with the AI researchers and with the, you know, yeah. our community, right? Just to say, okay, I can train this model. It's computed for a month on this data and it's, it's, it's learned something. And, uh, and I mean, I'm being hyperbolic here, but you know, it's learned something. We can make certain kinds of predictions. Are these predictions meaningful? Um, if I build an AI system that has some interpretability to the representations that it learns, who's gonna help me understand those representations, right? I mean, is it So my... that's what I call also the high value zone for the data, right? There's so few people who can actually generate simulations or use large scale data to use large scale compute to do something, to generate insights with that data. And, you know, that's the data reduction effort in a way. And in the whole field of data science, data engineering, data annotations, you know, knowledge generation, basically, once you have that, if you could actually capture that and save it in a way that it's findable and usable by others, you have a highly valuable data that could then affect change in different ways. And I think that's true. If people can understand what it means, and I think it's, so this is where the fair standards and all this kind of stuff fail, because, yeah. you know, I, I for example, imagine, uh, a genome, I'll just use genomics as an area I work in, right? So we have literally terabase, terabases of genomics data, and it's easily uh, shareable, it's easily obtainable. But yeah. uh, the average, mm -hmm. say, computing person can't interpret it. You, you have to have yeah. whole systems and training and bioinformatics tools and many things to actually understand what is contained in these things. And if I build an AI model that I train on a million genomes and I ask it a question like, is this a protein, you know, just show me examples of novel mm -hmm. proteins and maybe conjecture what those functions are, which is a perfectly reasonable question to ask a you know, if I had a grad student that was looking at a million genomes, I'd ask the grad student that, and if, mm -hmm. if they were, had a brain yeah. the size of a planet, they could ask, answer the question. But it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask an AI. It's really difficult now to find the room full of people mm -hmm. that are going to look at what the AI is spitting back, which might mostly be nonsense, oh, I see. Yeah, give it and tell me whether it's actually doing anything. And that's what I meant by this. So it's not sufficient to do all the things that, I mean, you know, what I'm talking about is wonderful. We have to do all that, but it's not sufficient. We're going to have to have teams of people who are, in some sense, partly curators, partly domain experts, critiquers. They have to be able to plug into these AI projects. And that 
expertise right now is extremely limited. It doesn't matter what the domain is, whether it's earth science, epidemiology, molecular mm -hmm. dynamics, fire mm -hmm. science, you know, whatever. You know what I'm talking about, like people who can bridge those spaces yeah. and who have enough understanding to make useful contributions. And that's what the next generation, we've got to create a whole community yeah. uh, that can do that, right? Uh, otherwise, the is progress why, is... Which is why I can't say fair without saying responsible. I'll always say fair and responsible <laughs> because responsibility is exactly what you said, right? It's interpretability, it's trustworthiness, it's accuracy, privacy issues in there. There's all these things, the scientificness, you know, there are so many domain specific things in the data that needs to be measured and explained for it to be useful. The uncertainty is sure. about the data. I mean, I mean it, it has things. to be all that, but, but what I'm saying is the, the under, you know, there's two things. The data has to be understandable, which means it has to be complete and all these kinds of things you're saying, but there has to be a, a person available to understand it, right? So I could have, I could have access to I all the, all the way you know, to say, if you had enough in there, AI can handle some of that. And that's, I think, the balance will find. I agree there needs to be person or persons, you know, team behind it. But at some point, I think we'll have systems that AI will actually step in and help aid the scientific yeah, endeavor. Yeah, I'm, I'm just talking about how do we bootstrap those systems? Because initially yeah. they're gonna be really uh, sketchy. Yeah, difficult to get, <laughs> yeah. Capturing that expertise and teamwork, right? That's exactly. Uh, actually, it's not just the, the, the interpretation of the results. I think probably one of the most important things is the is posing the right questions. You know, in many cases, yes. we ask, you know, uh, domain expert in the, the in, in 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 the algorithmic or or computer part, we 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 might lose the side of what really has value and what are the right questions to uh, to ask. And as you know, models, you know, have to be built, uh, built ar around those questions. And so everything changes in the pipeline if you don't work side by side with those domain experts. And you can't appreciate what is the quality and value of data that you are introducing in the pipeline without, without those, uh, those domain experts. So I, I think we need to evolve into, into those large interdisciplinary teams uh, uh, where there is this capacity of, of bridging the gaps of, of language and and, yeah. and, 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 and and technicalities. Otherwise, we will always be a little bit lost in translation. And, and, and I think probably that has happened to all of us to create wonderful things that are wonderfully useless in a sense than on, in, in the real world. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, that, that happens many times. And, and what we want to have is this, uh, those teams uh, that, that were, were really step by step from the conception of, of, of the project and the research till the final uh, use, uh, you are all together bringing your contribution, but with this ability of translating uh, to different languages and different uh, different problems and, 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 and disciplines. Yeah, I think having that understanding that science and technology without extra effort on the convergence of it doesn't really translate into practical application always. And actually, I would go all the way to say, if we don't think of it from the beginning, that impactful application in asking that question, it's often not the case. Right? Science mm -hmm. will happen without really application into the practical challenges. Yeah, at the same time, I think for the cool. domain expert, uh, there is a little bit of, uh, how to say, uh, computational literacy that they have to acquire uh, and uh, sure, yeah. to, to appreciate the value of what you can do with uh, <clears throat> with with, mm -hmm. with computational modeling and and uh, uh, and then with the supercomputing that in many cases is seen as something so exotic that okay, I don't go there. That's probably you know too much and 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 you know if we are able to communicate the value of 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 these new pipelines and 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 the power of computing uh, through success story for example and through this this kind of work that is really where we are creating a, the, the, the you know we are breaking the boundaries of what we were starting you know the conversation so this input and output problem that that, that we have
I think this is a really a, the, the uh, you know what happens with weather forecast is that you know everything now has merged in a way in which you have this this kind of of, of really of great communication from from the data acquisition to the the question that you ask to the how you actually uh, offer the, the final results. And, and, and really, and, uh, the supercomputing part, the computational part is all in, in the process, you know, and we should be able to do that in all the other disciplines and, and, and areas that we are tackling at the moment. I think what's, what's uh, interesting is that a lot of our discussion has actually, you know, completely ignored the technology and honed down on the human processes. Yeah. And, and this was something well, it's, that I it's going to be the I, right I limiter. I mean, we're, we're in a yeah. technological wonderland and um, yeah. it's it's not the I mean, we have to keep progress there. Right. It, that, there's no question about that. And, and the big moves you know, like Exascale and the follow on to that and what we're trying to do with AI and all that how all has to move. But I think we have to realize that it's not just the technology. Um, there's a huge human element. Maybe even the yeah. pandemic is making us realize because we can't hang out with yeah. people as much, right? That the human element is even more important than we maybe thought it was. Um, and But everything we're trying to do here is ultimately motivated either because it's a question somebody is asking a deep curiosity that a person has. I mean, our AIs are great, but they don't have any curiosity yet. They're not driving the questions. They're not choosing the questions, and they're not trying to help us as much as we're trying to help them become into being, right? And and so this is really, for the next foreseeable future, going to be about people, but connecting technology and, and creating this new generation of, of scientists who are super comfortable in... All of these spaces that we're talking about, they have to have some domain expertise, a lot of domain people, computing people, math people, architecture people, software people. We're going to need all of that, and we need to power that um, and keep imagining really compelling problems and applications right, to drive this forward. I'd like to point out to our own academic culture and what we value as well, because science and academic culture values depth of expertise. Uh, and it leaves very little room for that breadth of solving a problem and understanding others, curio being curious about others, uh, what they are doing, and having sort of this shallow understanding. And we need uh, people who are experts in the depth still, of course. There are many things that can be done. But I think uh, what I'm interpreting, I don't know if this is a controversial statement, but uh, the discussion is we need the science of breadth. And that's the new thing that's coming that has a lot more human involvement. And how do we make that efficiently? And how do we make actually teams work effectively uh, at that integration level? And I agree, we need a lot more tools for that. It's a bias, maybe, because I work in that area. <laughs> I, I think also that in, in a way, you know, we are focusing more on what is the problem, the interface, the human factor, also because the technologies that we will build and we will develop will be driven by the scientific question. So do we want to develop new uh, advances because we want to favor parallel computing of a certain kind, or perhaps is the distributed, uh, you know, database uh, uh, query or whatever. So that depends on the problem that, uh, so our technology, our our effort in that area will will depend on the scientific questions. And, and, and so it's crucial that they, those questions and the domain expertise are in the loop since, since the start, since the outset. This relates to anyway. the question. Actually, I wanted to ask my fellow panelists here, you know, what are the lessons learned in this COVID-19 experience for us as computing and science researchers, right? For me, it's definitely what struck out is when you're in the middle of a disaster, trying to do this is not the right approach. You're quite, you can sprout a few ideas and do things, but we need to get prepared for solving those problems before they hit us in the face. Uh, what are other lessons learned in your sub -areas? I kind of feel, though, I don't know. Can I kind of feel like this is our preparation for SARS-3. This is our preparation for when we yeah. lose antibiotics. This is our preparation yeah. when it's so hot that everything starts to die. Um, we're going to have to, like, adjust to working in, uh, you know, super high-stress, super integrated environments. Well, I think that's, I don't know. I think that's 
kind of right. I mean, this is a practice run yeah. like everything is in life, but I, there's really positive things. I remember in the early parts of the pandemic, I mean, we put out messages no, to our friends. No, there's nothing positive. I'm definitely No, there, there, no, there, is, there is, actually, because what, you know, people really stopped what they were doing <laughs> and started collaborating, right? Within a few weeks, we had over 200 people that were working on things uh, across many areas, epidemiology and drugs and no, evolution agree, and so on, trying to understand stuff. And that was not, nobody yeah. was forcing people to do that, right? It was... It, it, people were coming together and, and we started using the technology that we'd already been working on for other problems. And it's true, some of us sure. were working on antibiotics for a long time, so you know it wasn't that you know, cancer or something, and so we pivoted. But, but the fact that people jumped in and it was relatively easy to find something to do that was useful and, and we kept rolling, yeah. I think, is a really good sign. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. uh, and that, and that you know, the institutions uh, followed, right, with, with some uh, moves, right? Um, but what this means is that people are pretty resilient. And if you're a technologist and you you have a, a kind of a spectrum of things that you can do to be useful, right, you can quickly find something useful to do when there's a crisis. And that's what people have done. Now, how do we avoid the startup cost and the frustrations and the, you know, randomness next time. I think you've got to yeah. have some sustained capability. I think is what you were getting at, Romy, right? And and, uh, and Alex was talking about this too, right? If you have some kind of national center that's kind of prepared for these things. And uh, what's really interesting is right after 9-11, uh, there, you know, NIH set up centers and lots of people had reactions and there was a lot of stuff going for quite a long time. And then no, no new bad thing happened, and then some of that got torn down, and now we're having to build it up again. And so, what we're the lesson, one of the lessons we're learning is that we have to have patience. You know, if we, uh, you know, humanity is going to be a long time on this planet if we are careful, and we have to build institutions that that uh, you know can be resilient Help against these things. Help promote our own longevity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. that implies that we need to find the mechanism to make those efforts sustainable also when you tend to yeah. forget about the emergencies and, and, and the threats. Uh, and, yes. you know, the, the, for, for instance, for pandemic, we have been telling all agencies and all governments of the world uh, every other month about the fact that uh, the next pandemic was not a, a matter of a if, but just a matter yeah. of when. And, you know, yeah. but yeah, the, some things moved and then slowly you start to get a few coordinated efforts. But, you know, I, I think then here you see what you really need to have uh, and deployable on the field uh, right out of the, 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 the start of a pandemic. and and. Uh, I hope that this will be a lesson for many, many other areas, for many, many other problems. But they require resources, and that's 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 one of the major uh, thing to say. You know, that's not just uh, oh well, we will fund a little bit more uh, university teams here and there. You know, this is really creating framework, large scale framework of large scale yeah. collaboration. We have been able to do in certain areas. Just think about mm -hmm. physics. But you know why we don't have to do in other in other in other areas or disciplines uh, in a way that is distributed across the world. That's 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 crucial that we learn this lesson now. And where I mean the the large initiatives and and and, and coordinated effort, I just don't mean the the government or the the, the federal grants or or the, the the things, but even the corporation and and the, the the business world. So what we are seeing here with COVID, that you know everybody wants to. Uh, to contribute, everybody wants to do something relevant for for the effort. Well, we have to keep doing that also in peacetime. I I, I always distinguish. Now we are in in a war time, and it's easier mm -hmm. to uh, to have a call for uh, for arms for everybody, you know, and say, yeah, just join the the, the the army. But then when we enter peacetime, this is the crucial moment where we have actually to prepare and to do things more than than in, uh, than now, yeah. in, a, in, in a sense. And, and that is the very difficult part to communicate. This is where, mm -hmm. you know, the big events like the one we are participating, et cetera, are to make uh, a call for for those kind of uh, uh, initiatives because that's these are crucial for the for the future thank you everybody for what was a really great discussion and thanks to the panelists for putting in in uh, this this time
Um, we'll now be turning over the questions to my colleague, Tony Pena, who will be taking moderated questions uh, live. Hello, thank you for attending this more than HPC plenary session in this so special SC edition. Uh, I'm Tony Peña from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and I will be moderating this live Q&A session. Just in case you joined late, let me briefly reintroduce our panelists. We are with uh, Professor Romy Amaro from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Dr. Ilka El Tintas from the University of California, San Diego. Um, Professor Rico Stevens from Margo National Laboratory. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Alex Vespignani from Northeastern University has been unable to join us in, in this session. And now it is your turn. Please keep typing in your questions in the box and I will transfer them to the panelists as we have time. Um, so we have a question from Philip Roth. Uh, uh, he says, in your work on various aspects of on the COVID-19 response, which things outlive the current crisis, crisis and which would you revisit to do uh, differently if you had more time. I can go ahead and take a shot at that, Antonio. Um, right, so uh, for the types of things that we do in terms of which things outliving the current crisis, I think that the ability to sort of rapidly mobilize the HPC consortium, you know, I hope that that could be like almost instantaneously you know, recapitulated and, you know, they, they did get that up and running pretty quickly, but it, in, in a case like when you're solving the problem in real time, the, you know, every day really matters. So, you know, hopefully that's something that could be sort of restarted. Um, I think another sort of aspect more on the research side has been the, that I hope will outlive the current crisis is this sort of real integration across the sectors. Um, I think that you know, we have, you know, not to do a shameless plug, but for the research, um, even from what I presented has really matured over the past uh, couple of weeks. And um, you know, I think you'll hear, for example, in some of the Gordon Bell for COVID-19 uh, sessions on Thursday about how people coming together from various uh, branches has really been a game changer. Um, which would I do revisit differently? Uh, you know. We, I think that, I, uh, it, I guess it's, it's a little unclear as to whether it would have been the best approach or not, but, you know, at the beginning, my sense on the science side, like we had tried to approach, for example, the NIH about trying to coordinate efforts in terms of small molecule discovery against particular targets. And we had a lot of resistance federally to do that. They wanted to see more of a grassroots organization. Um, I think we need both, to be honest, but, you know, uh, that's, that's something that I, that I would hope might be revisited perhaps under a different administration. And then the other thing that I really think is the most important is effectively communicating the results of this type of science to humanity, right? So for example, and we still really don't have that necessarily, for example, with masks, um, you know, where, uh, you know, we learned through the course of this uh, using various models and so forth that this is an aerosol transmitted disease and yet there's still resistance to this. So I think that, I think a big lesson for the world is gonna be um, in revisiting how we sort of communicate effectively cutting edge science uh, to, to the people. I don't know what uh, Ilkay and maybe Rick think. I think one of the issues is that it's too late when you try to get organized when the hazard is happening, it's often too late. Uh, having those collaborative pathways between data providers and uh, the groups who can take advantage of the data uh, to make progress prior to events like this is uh, important. Um, so I think we had more time. So a lot of those pathways have happened throughout the last six to nine months. So we are actually uh, making progress. I think they might actually outlive this crisis. And for the next one, we might be more prepared with the right uh, relationships in place and more technology to turn data into useful bits in real time. Uh, Rick, do you have anything to add here? No, I think that they covered it. Um, I mean, okay. 
let's go on to the next question. There's lots of questions. Thanks. So uh, next question is from Bronis Dzepinski and it is for Alex and Ilkay. Many of the epidemi epidemiological models in the news appear to have relatively small computational requirements. How do large scale resources improve accuracy and decision making in this area? So I think there's a need to match individual data to uh, societal scale models. Right? There's that uh, thing that we could understand from individualized data from these internet of things type environments or different surveys and contact data and things like that. And that requires a big data and computational infrastructure that uh, help us then turn these large volumes of data uh, into representations that could be coupled to uh, societal models of the spread and other things. So that could be one and I think same philosophy can be applied to uh, understanding the virus and the treatment, you know, so coupling those type of it. So uh, I think the large scale part there is comes from really data processing and making sure that data is useful in the large scale context. That's one of them at least. <laughs> Thanks, Ilkay. Uh, Romy or Rick, do you want to add anything to this? Well, one thing that you can use large scale computing for is to understand the sensitivity of your model to assumptions. So you can run large ensembles. And I think that's one of the key steps is to try to understand the uncertainty that our modeling frameworks have. And you can really do that if you have access to a large amount of computing to run thousands or millions of scenarios. Um, and then of course, some models in fact do need large amounts of computing because they're more individual based. Um, I think it was kind of hinting at that, but there's you know differences between models that are basically OE integrators versus models that are kind of uh, individual models of individual behavior that you aggregate up more like individual based eco ecosystem models. And those can require large amounts of computing just to run the basic scenario. And then if you're doing ensembles with that, it's also large. Thanks. Uh, next question from Hugo Hernandez. Uh, back in 2016, a hot topic at SC20 SC or a hot topic at SC16, I guess, was prediction medicine. Four years later, what did we learn uh, we are applying to deal with COVID-19 from a supercomputing perspective? Is there anything that we learned? Well, I can try to answer the question. So, you know, in 2016, the topics on precision medicine uh, largely or around this idea that we can devise personalized treatment based on the individual genetics or history of each person. I think one of the challenges with applying that, uh, of course it needs computing to do that and some models and so on, but the problem with applying that to something like COVID is that first of all, we, we don't have a baseline, you know, we were not collecting human genomes at the same time we were collecting virus samples. Um, that some, some countries have done that, um, but that was not uh, done uh, as a matter of course. And so this idea of trying to understand how an individual's genetic uh, background uh, impacts the severity or the course of COVID is not something that there's been a lot of progress on in, in the last you know, six, six to eight months. Um, so that's been uh, something that in the long term we, you'd like to understand that. The other thing you'd like to understand is the degree at which individuals differ in their response, say, to vaccines or antibodies. And of course, it's too early for that. We don't have the data. We don't have uh, that. So I think personalized medicine uh, points us in a direction uh, that we have to actually collect a lot of data about individuals um, and then relate that to the disease state and relate that to the treatments. And that's a, a vision for the future in infectious disease. But, but in terms of COVID, it's not something we've been able to really leverage in the short term. Thanks. Promi, do you want to say anything? Well, just that I agree with that. You know, I think that there's uh, so many aspects, mainly in terms of the data acquisition that, um, you know, we just haven't gotten to the, to the necessary pace that one needs to be able to like identify in real time. You know, there's still so much more of the basic science that needs to be worked out. But I also just add too, I mean, precision medicine, but also there's, there's, there will be variants and mutations, for example, that will be somewhat similar to human genetic mutations, but that we need to flesh out on the virus side. 
Um, and that's, that's come a little bit more quickly because the complexity of the virus, you know, relative to the human system is so much less. Um, so there has been some, some movement there, but, you know, the dream of the real sort of precision personalized medicine is still one that, you know, we're chasing, I think, collectively. Yeah. Uh, anything to add, Ilkay? I think it's been covered. Okay. Want to Thanks. Uh, so moving on to next question from Sarvani Chadalapaka. Sorry if I mess up uh, last names or first names. Uh, she thanks you for a great discussion and she asks, what measures do you take to ensure the data acquisition is from diverse data sources and that the models you develop serve as demographically diverse population as possible? Um, so this is a big problem and in different contexts of what problem are we referring to, it could change. Uh, I can go back to the ring data, for instance, right? Uh, we have this large scale study uh, coming from individuals and there uh, one of the approaches have been to, um, to uh, communicate with, for instance, uh, authorities to get data on the prisoner population or um, you know, uh, other uh, underrepresented or uh, disadvantaged communities. So we could reach out to them and create basically data sets out of uh, such populations. That's been one of the approaches. I think in general in medicine, there is a need for more diverse data and models that can capture this diverse data. So it's a huge problem and social media and contact data similarly could be used to overcome some of this. There's been some scratching the surface type of studies that's going on. I would agree to that if I could just add, I mean, I think that, you know, going back to the first question you asked about what will outlive this, uh, this particular event, I think that in the case we've really seen how, you know, health disparities, for example, particularly with minority populations and so forth, it, um, there's a real burden there that we need to address and face. And I think maybe maybe one, I hope, one lasting outcome of this is that we really sort of turn our attention to these really critical needs in our uh, ability, not only to do the modeling, but for service and so forth. Thanks, uh, anything to add, Rick? No, I think everyone, well, I can add a little bit. People are very sensitized to this issue uh, to the degree that we are collecting data we need to be super mindful of collecting it as broadly as we can and to make sure that when we're using that data in models that we're, that we're aware of the bias or lack of diversity in the data. So I think, uh, I don't think there's anything, you know, in, in the COVID situation, I mean, we, because we see such uh, impact on some communities from COVID that's differentially, um, you know, relative uh, to other populations that, in future studies or in you know, vaccine studies or whatever, though we need to be very particular about uh, coverage. Um. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is from Alistair Johnson. Uh, this is a two part question. She says, in scaling up all these tools to work on COVID, how much of the code had to be optimized, retarget or retargeted or rewritten so it could run at scale on all these machines? And uh, second, if there were any problems with that, what would you have wanted out of the programming models used in these programs to streamline or improve that process or remove the problems entirely? Maybe I'll take that one first because I have an easy answer or Rick, you were about to say something. I mean, well, I can say from- Go ahead. Go. I was just gonna say quickly, I'll just say, you know, from, this, from the types of workflows that we're doing, um, at least with molecular stimulation, you know, from day one, in fact, we we were in touch with the software developers as well as the hardware architecture team to sort of partner in making sure that the builds we were using were as optimized as possible per platform. Um, you'll hear more about, you know, if you wanted to, you could hear more about that at the Gordon Bell thing on Thursday. Um, but it is is something important. Probably, you know, Rick has and Ilkay may have more to add. Well, I was just going to say that we had already been running our workflows on large scale machines because of our cancer project, <clears throat> our candle project. And so when we pivoted, it wasn't, we didn't really have to change too much in the code. So we were already running on the uh, MIG machines, uh, you know, in DOE and so on. But what was different was the fact that we 
looked at our workflow and we tried to optimize which stages were running on which platforms. And we ended up running across about, I don't know, eight different platforms. And we put the, the modules that really needed x86 compatibility on places like Frontera and places like San Diego. And we moved the GPU codes, and, you know, and we did a lot of tuning in the workflow. Um, but the underlying components mostly were already efficient on the target platforms. Well, I don't have a lot to add to that, but coming from a big data point of view, similarly, I think having the right architecture and the platforms to handle, you know, real time updates over time and, you know, having large memory architectures, for instance, to be able to do uh, large volume ma um, matching for creating features out of these data sets, uh, statistical features and things like that. So I think uh, this ability to batch and then use another platform downstream to actually use the results of those batches and uh, other analytical uh, workflows, so to say, required uh, looking at it from a, you know, okay, we can do this in database now, but how do you do it in parallel, for instance, uh, when you have more data on a regular basis coming in in real time. So um, those type of things, I think, uh, are slowly becoming more mainstream, but this type of pandemic study has made it really apparent as a need. If I could just add one thing, actually, maybe just if I could add one more thing, because actually in listening to them, I was reminded of something. Um, we did run into issues, so uh, I didn't talk about this in the in the plenary, but um, you know, the spike protein, for example, we were trying of this, uh, you know, for the virus, we were trying to do use some novel AI methods to help us sort of drive the conformational sampling to accelerate what we would find in simulation. And there we did run into significant memory issues because this is like, you know, a lot of the development work for these types of codes has been done on much smaller systems. And then when presented with an, a real challenge like with COVID, it did really sort of stretch the capabilities. And that took a, a lot of sort of like figuring out which would be the right hardware. And, you know, I'm not the right person to talk about the details of that particular code, but we did face that. And the other thing that Ilkay mentioned that I just also wanted to touch on was this idea also something that was really important for us was using really so many pieces of the cyber infrastructure ecosystem where we could do sort of preparatory work, for example, on Frontera that was really critical to, for example, building the virus simulations, but then we were able to run like production on Summit, you know, um, and having, that's just one example, but having the ability to sort of, to touch on and to really use uh, in a sort of rapid turnaround manner, uh, you know, useful way, you know, these different architectures was, has, was really key for us. And I think probably will be something also that for, you know, future events like this. Thank you. Uh, next question from Andrew Michaelis. Uh, there's a fair amount of discussion about ingesting data from public and private sources here. Given the lots and lots of data sets one may ingest and use to achieve a result, what do you advise on data integrity, the risks of data manipulation by the nefarious actors that could lead groups to unintentionally bad result, et cetera? Any good examples of a bad result that was achieved using bad data that sticks out in your minds? Just curious. Um, well, I don't have any particular example of bad data that was a result of nefarious you know, minds, but what we did try to do in our workflows is build in as many internal consistency checks as we can. So we're constantly looking at the distributions of these very large data sets. If you have billions of molecules coming from a library and you're trying to screen them, you don't have time, you can't look at every single molecule, but what you can do is make computational passes and look at distributions and look at outliers and look and, and ask questions of the large data set uh, through queries to see if, it, if things meet your expectations. And if you've got two very large collections, do those distributions, uh, how similar are they? And if you're making assumptions that they should be similar, why, if they're not, why, why not? And you dig in. So I think the idea here is that for these, uh, these large public data sets, uh, I'm not talking about public as in, you know, personal data sets, but from companies and from academic groups, um, we're constantly comparing them 
and in the case of molecules, case of compounds, you can compute representations that allow you to uh, search one with the contents of another one and so on. And that, that was super useful in trying to understand how unique are aspects of these data sets, how much overlap is there. And I think all that adds to our confidence in the results. Um, but I think it's an important question that uh, when you're aggregating terabytes of data from many sources, you have to have tools to actually help you answer this question. And to add to that, when you have multi-modalities of data, I think some of the data can be used to check, cross-check integrity between data sets. And uh, so, you know, I don't have an example for that for COVID-19, but for instance, for fire ignitions and perimeters, we use data from multiple sources and create an uncertainty on uh, where the fire is or what the ignition point was. I think similar things could be applied to this type of problems. Anything to add, Romy? Okay, so unfortunately we are out of time. We know there are there were many, many more questions. This is what we could uh, reach. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, our panelists, Romy Amaro, Rick Stevens, Ilka Tintas, also Alice Vespiniani and, and my colleague, David Abramson. Uh, thank you all for attending. And before you log off, please stay tuned for some brief information on the conference's first ever virtual exhibits program this year. Thank you again, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>